going to be arguing for both sides. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. Joseph Smith on behalf of Mr. Peterson. I'll be arguing for that. Okay. Good morning, Your Honor. Tim Donnelly appearing on behalf of the state of Florida. I'll be arguing. I have Mr. Killer and Chris Killer and Sylvia Pizzi. Okay. Does the defense have any testimony or evidence they wish to present in support of your motion? Your Honor, if the court would be willing, we'd like to proceed by proper. Any objections? No, Your Honor. No objections. Okay. Go ahead. Your Honor, my client lives in North Carolina and has for approximately the last year. Okay. Before that, he was a longtime resident of Broward County, South Florida. He worked for the Broward Sheriff's Office for decades as a school resource officer. I don't believe there can be any dispute as to that. My client has no criminal history. My client is not a risk to the community. He is not a flight risk. There has been no allegations that he's been witness tampering, that he's been intimidating any witnesses. And frankly, Your Honor, all the mandatory factors under 903.046 subsection 2, all of those factors militate in favor of my client, those factors that this court must consider. Consequently, Your Honor, I think all those factors this court can consider and all those factors in your to my client's benefit. Okay. If the court would like to write an argument, I'd be willing to do so. Or if the court would like to hear from the prosecution, I can defer. I have a few questions first. What is the, what's the bottom line of the passport? So his better half flew to North Carolina yesterday. Okay. She got the passport out of the safe deposit box. Okay. She literally talked to me this morning and texted me a copy of the passport. Okay. I just got a text from her. She's unable to same day it to me, so she's not going to be able to get it here today, or at least during business hours. She is going to be driving from North Carolina back down to South Florida. I anticipate her to make the 12 to 14 hour drive today and will be arriving in South Florida, give or take 9 o'clock tonight. You know, all things going well. And at that time, hopefully I'll be able to obtain the passport from her and it'll be in my custody and care control. Okay. So I understand your arguments under the statute, but you're asking this court to remove the pretrial release level two of the monitor as well as find some medium ground on the passport issue. Correct. Your Honor, I believe it's more than reasonable for this court to give my client 24, I'd say 48 hours, you know, just in case to provide the passport and surrender it to the clerk of the court. I don't believe that is unreasonable under the circumstances. And as to the level two monitor, I believe as this court is aware, given my client's residence out of state, a level two monitor with an ankle bracelet with GPS monitor is not feasible. I submit that under the circumstances, the standard pretrial conditions for my client should be treated like any other criminal defendant standing before the court would be appropriate. And then just allow my client to call in. However, my client has always returned to South Florida in respect to the civil cases pending before Judge Henning and for the other civil cases that are pending, I believe, in federal district court or the Southern District of Florida. Consequently, my client, I anticipate, will have to return in respect to those cases in the near future. And when that happens, I'll be more than happy to have my client check in personally with pretrial services at that time. And I think that would be more than sufficient to ensure this court, any concern this court has about my client's ability to stand before this court when appropriate. Okay. So your motion seems to suggest you're asking me to delete more than just the passport requirement and the GPS requirement. Is that all you're asking me to do? Well, Your Honor, I would ask that the court release my client ROR and vacate all the special conditions. However, if this court is unable or unwilling to do that in the alternative, I would ask for the reduction in the bond amount and at a minimum the special condition found at special condition two, I believe. Give me a second. No, special condition one, that special condition one be stricken and that the standard pretrial conditions for calling be put in its place. Okay. State, do you want to respond? Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. 
couple days ago, um, Judge Siegel signed the uh, search warrant, arrest warrant, and he based that upon the 34-page probable cause affidavit that was presented to him by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. After reading the probable cause affidavit, Judge Siegel, the chief administrative criminal judge, set the bond. The state didn't have any uh, suggestions for the bond. Judge Siegel went through after reading that. Um, he set uh, each term, each condition. As you can see on his order, he actually wrote in uh, additional conditions, the passport or the uh, the ankle monitor and the collateral collateralized bond. Um, so our position is, I'm not going to undercut the circuit judge, uh, the criminal administrative judge who reviewed this warrant and issued this bond. Um, it's certainly up to this court to do that if it so desires. I take great issue with the motion that was filed and the reasons that they're asking for the uh, bond to be reduced, um, I believe it's a fallacy. They're talking about in the motion itself, seven of the uh, charges um, not having any merit to them. Two days ago when they called me, they told me that four of the charges, the statute of limitations had passed. I had to direct them to the statute for that. Um, at the appropriate time, when during the conversation I had with them two days ago, I told them that they could file after charges have been officially filed, a motion to dismiss, and we would address that at the time that they did file such a motion to dismiss. However, in this particular motion, um, it's, in my opinion, disingenuous, and I think it is a fallacy to the court. And I'll specifically address on page three at the top of the motion, where they're talking about other person responsible for a child's welfare expressly excluding a law enforcement officer acting in an official capacity. And that's from a Florida statute 39.0154. The defendant was arrested under 827.03, the child abuse, child neglect statute. 39.01, chapter 39, deals with DCF and with protecting children in custody um, and the whole set of criteria there. But more importantly, if you go back to 2003 and you look at that particular statute, 39.014, I've got a copy for the court and for defense in the subsequent years. Well, this will be the 2003 edition. Of it does not have in there. This, what's in their motion does not address the entire section of 54, 39.0154. It leaves out the beginning of it. It leaves out where this specifically says that it's excluded. And if you look at, it specifically says, other person responsible for a child's welfare includes the child's legal guardian or foster parent, an employee of any school, public or private child daycare center, residential home, institution, facility, or agency, a law enforcement officer employed in any facility, service, or program for children that is operated or contracted by the Department of Justice, or any other person legally responsible for the child's welfare in a residential setting and also includes an adult sitter or relative entrusted with the child's care. For the purpose of departmental investigative jurisdiction, this definition does not include the following persons when they are acting in an official capacity, law enforcement officers, except as otherwise provided in this subsection. That deals with investigations in DCF. And what's interesting about this is in 2003, the prior language right above that, which included law enforcement officer, was not part of the statute. That was added in 2006. I've given you the laws of Florida where it was added. It's now part of the statute even today. 
So when they're talking about this excluded law enforcement officer, if they want to proceed under that section, it specifically included law enforcement officers after that date. But this section isn't even applicable because there, because there are two cases that, 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 that basically say that, Your Honor. One of them is cited in their motion, and it's the Christie case at 939 Southern 2nd, 1078, 3rd DCA, 2005. And then it's followed up by State v. Nolan at 50 Southern 3rd, 79, 1st District, 2010. And I'll give these to the court. But this says, neither Chapter 39, and this is under Nolan, neither Chapter 39 nor Chapter 827 reveals a legislative intent that terms common to both chapters be defined according to Chapter 39. Indeed, there is no need to refer to the Section 39.01, Subsection 47, definition of other person responsible for a child's welfare in considering a neglect charge under Section 827.03. They found an error when they did, and they said it's because it's plain and obvious meaning in everyday parlance. So if they want to include 39, he is included. But it shouldn't be included because the law says it's not supposed to be. So that's a disingenuous argument in their motion when they say, oh, he can't, he's excluded from being considered under 827.03. 827.03 definition of caregiver is very broad. It's included kidnappers. It's included juveniles. It's included teachers. As I said, we're not here today for a motion to dismiss, but they bring it up to show the strength or lack of strength in the charges. However, the 34-page affidavit goes through the actions of the defendant and his omissions and commissions in the charging of 827.03. And Judge Siegel had reviewed it, and he set those conditions of his bond because of it. Again, the state's position with the amount of bond, we recognize that it's the court's responsibility to ensure the defendant's present. However, the court wants to do that. It's susceptible to the state. However, we don't want based upon the fallacies contained in the motion, and that we would then defer to the court the specific conditions that the court may or may not want to impose. Okay. Anything else? Yes, Your Honor. Counsel to the government has presented no argument that my client is a plagiarist or deemed to be mute. Indeed, in the 16 months since these events took place, he's been out free at his liberty, and the government did not seek to take him into custody shortly thereafter the events. In this case, given that he lives out of state, the level 2 monitor with GPS would be tantamount to no bond. Now, turning to the strength or weight of the evidence against my client, Your Honor, the definition in 827.01 for caregiver, my client is obviously not an adult or custodial guardian or anything of the like. As to the other person responsible for a child's welfare, that term is not defined in 827. I believe that this court, in order to avoid having to find the statute unconstitutionally vague, would have to review 39.0154 in pari materia, and 59.04 is a two-sentence subsection. And the first sentence of 59.04 
defines the term other person responsible for a child's welfare, and then it has a list of clauses in there. My, my client doesn't fit any of the statutory definitions in the first sentence under subsection 54. After going into the second sentence, and this is why I made this argument, assuming for, for sake of argument that somehow my client would fit into any of the independent clauses in subsection 54, the second sentence goes on to limit the first sentence and exclusively, exclusively carves out law enforcement officers. Now, to me, the, for purposes of an investigative jurisdiction, to me that means when a law enforcement officer is doing his job investigating a crime, which I believe there can be no dispute that being on the scene of a crime, that's what a law enforcement officer does. So giving the government the benefit of the doubt as to the applicability of the first sentence of subsection 54, there is still the express statutory carve out. So given that statutory construction of 827.01 and 39.0154 being read in par materia, which would leave the court having to engage in any type of constitutional inquiry and save the statute for constitutional infirmity, the court can consider that when determining the strength of the government's evidence against my client in light of the proposed charges against my client. With that being said, Your Honor, I believe for all the reasons that I just stated and I stated in my opening, in combined with the arguments set forth in my moving papers, my client should be RORed and all the conditions vacated. But I think the alternative, the bond amount should be greatly reduced and the level two condition, along with GPS monitor, which is not a special condition for one, should be vacated in total. And my client be allowed to do a standard pretrial report and call in from North Carolina and personally appear when he's in South Florida. Before the court stands an accused with, as far as I can tell, no prior criminal convictions, the defendant has attended all related court appearances. He's appeared in court on related cases each time he was asked to do so. He has been living in this community, meaning Broward County. He lived in this community for a long time and now has moved to North Carolina. My job is to determine a reasonable bond under all the circumstances, a reasonable bond and one that can protect the community and ensure the defendant's presence in court. And I believe the following bond will do all of those things. I'm going to reduce counts one through seven to $5,000. Count eight, nine, 10, and 11 will remain at $1,000 as previously set. I am going to modify the condition of pretrial release so that the defendant is not required to be monitored under house arrest with a GPS monitor, but he's going to be on standard pretrial release. I'm also going to require that within 48 hours of his release from custody, the bondsman surrender the passport to the clerk of the circuit court. I am going to order that the defendant not be employed as a special condition, that he not be employed in any way with any minors. And as far as the special conditions go, that's it. Is there anything else that we need to address today? Are you eliminating the other conditions that Judge Siegel had? The NEBIA requirement? No, no, the requirement of the firearm, the firearms. Are you here? Counsel, I know it's in your brief. Are you
number on count 11. It, it looks like 1,500, but maybe 1,000? I did see that. Let me... Uh the, the sheriff's office website, oh, I'm sorry, which count was this? On 11? 11. 11 is 1,500. And so that's going to remain at 1,500. I, I misspoke. I said 1,000 because I thought it was 1,000. Yeah. Your Honor, there's two minor issues with it. Uh, I'm sorry, David, so we'll be at Scott Peterson. I haven't filed a notice of appearance yet. I'll file a notice of limited appearance in the process of being retained. Uh, with regards to the fully collateralization of the bond, uh, we have a bondsman present, Mr. Durkee from AC, which only bail bonds. Who is prepared if your honor wants to take his testimony? Uh, property has been pledged as worth $330,000, which is free and clear of any liens. We will have all that paperwork over 